So who here, by show of hands, who here remembers the first day of the job that they have right now? All right, a couple of bad memories, that's all right. If you're anything like me, you probably showed up early. On your first day, you're excited, you got your cup of coffee, you're ready to take on the world, and then on day 500, you want to stab your coworker. So if you're laughing, you've thought it. And if you're not laughing, somebody's probably thought it about you. But what happened? What happened between day one and day 500? Your role didn't change. I would argue it's our perspective of that role that changes. You see, because in the beginning, our ambitions are so idealistic. Our intentions are so righteous. Our goals are so definitive. And our sense of purpose is so clear. But like a glass door that gets handled too often, smudges begin to appear. It distorts and obstructs our view of the role that we find ourselves in. All those little things, the data and minutia, the unread emails, the office politics, the KPIs, the meetings that should have been an email, the Zoom meetings that go on forever, all of those things, they detract from us remembering why we cared so much about our role. I guarantee you didn't get into your role for the fame or the fortune, did you? Anybody? No. You got into it because you cared about people. But we lose sight of that, and it happens in all of our roles. I don't care if you're the VP of XYZ or the chief blankety-blank officer. It doesn't matter. We lose sight of why we cared so much. And it's not just our professional roles. The same thing happens in our personal roles as well. Our roles as friend or parent or partner. So what I want to do today is, is help you remember and help rekindle that place we were so engaged so that you can be in a place that we can thrive together. So, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions real quick. Excuse me, sir. Hi, I'm Josh. I'm gonna ask you a question. If you could be any animal in the world, what would it be? Eagle. An eagle. It's very patriotic of you, sir. They like, fly. they fly. Very nice. They're also pretty vicious. I like that. It's great. Excuse me, sir, if you could be any animal in the entire world, what would you be? Uh, a lion. A lion. Fearsome. I love it. Hi, I'm Josh. Hi, Josh. I'm going to ask you a question. You probably know what it is, but I'm going to ask it again anyway. <laughs> if you could be any animal in the entire world, what would you be? A golden doodle. A golden doodle? <laughs> like it? An upper middle class dog? Three walks a day, head pats. <laughs> nice. Nice fluffy bed to lay in. That's wonderful, yeah. May we all be so lucky. So I didn't just lose my mind and start asking random questions. The reason I asked that is because those are your answers. You're an eagle. You're a lion. You're a labradoodle. But those are your answers. That's wonderful. Because it's a subjective question. So if I was to go to you, or maybe one of your team members that you work with, and say, hey, what constitutes a great organizational culture or a great team culture? That's a subjective question. There's no underlying single answer for it. We'd get all kinds of answers for it. We'd get, you know, it's about passion, or it's about zeal, it's about commitment. And while all these may be true to some people, that's not a common definition. I think if we're going to find out what really constitutes a great team or organizational culture, we need to find a common definition. I think I found one. And if you disagree, feel free to raise your hand so I can chastise you publicly. Here's what I think defines a good organizational culture. That's being engaged in what you're doing and having fun while you're doing it. Now, by this, I mean that you actually care about the work in front of you. You're paying attention. You're f you can focus on what you have at hand. And then fun doesn't mean that it's all you know, free tacos on Tuesdays. It means that you enjoy the work, that you derive fulfillment and satisfaction from the work that you're completing. There's some neat empirical evidence about what engaged employees do to organizations. They did a Gallup poll study, and this is just pre-COVID. They found that at any given organization, on average, only 29% of people are actually engaged. And that's shameful, isn't it? That means that 71% of people at any given organization are working just hard enough to not get fired. A few of you are thinking about people that you work with, you're like, no, they're working hard enough to get fired. It's coming. That's fine. 
But in this study, they found that 24% of people, it's almost a full quarter of any given organization on average, are actively disengaged. And actively disengaged is described as working counterproductively to the goals of your organization. What does that look like? It looks like those people that play on Facebook at work, that take longer lunches than they should, that gossip about coworkers around the water cooler, that attend the Zoom meeting with the camera off so they can fold laundry. I'm not going to lie, I've done it. But what's really crazy is they took the organizations with the most engaged employees and compared them to the organizations with the least engaged employees. And it's wild to look at it because people think, well, you know, even if they're doing the bare minimum, they're doing enough, right? We can still have an effective organization. But what they found is the organizations with the most engaged employees were 22% more profitable. They had 10% higher customer ratings. They had 28% less theft. Time theft is included in that number. And then they had 48% fewer safety incidents. Well, of course, the safety incidents thing, when people are paying attention to what they're doing, they're not going to be hurting themselves on the job. So this is why it's important. This is why engagement should be important to every single one of us and every single one of our leaders within our organizations. So the next question becomes, OK, that's why. How? How can we evoke engagement from ourselves and from our team members? Great question. Comes into three things. Influences, that's the influences in our lives, the things that are constantly impacting us on a day-to-day -day basis, and also how we wield influence in the lives of our team members and the people that we come in contact with. The second one is our perceptions, it's our view or outlook on the world. And the third is our aspirations. That's that vision, that goal. Simon Sinek talks about the big why. This is how we get people to re-engage. Now there's a neat parable if you've ever heard it, but I'm gonna tell you again, because it's wonderful of this foreman walking through a construction yard, and he comes across these three masons that are working with bricks and mortar. And he comes to the first mason, and he goes, excuse me, what are you doing? And that mason says, well, I'm, I'm laying bricks. Then the foreman comes to the second mason, and he goes, excuse me, what are you doing? And that mason says, well, I'm building this wall. Then the foreman comes to the third mason, and he goes, excuse me, what are you doing? And that mason, he sets down his trowel, and he looks up the sky, and he smiles, and he says, I'm building a cathedral. Which one of those masons do you think is excited on Monday morning walking into the construction yard? Obviously the third mason. Which one is leaving on Friday with a sense of fulfillment and pride in the work that he's accomplished? That third mason. Here's the funny thing. Those three masons have the exact same KPIs, don't they? They do the same work. They cut bricks, they mix mortar, they go but it's in their perspective that's different, is what allows them to be engaged. So let's move to our first, influences. We are constantly being influenced by things in our lives. We need to avoid these pirates, right? They're taking over middle space. They're stealing from you things that make you productive. And we need to be cognizant of that. So by a show of hands, please be honest. Who here reads, watches, or listens to the news in the morning before work? Just be honest. Stop it. <laughs> when you get funny looks, you go, no, Josh, I'm an adult. I'm a professional. I can look at the news, and it doesn't impact me. Are you sure? Because we know children are easily influenced, don't we? I have three young kids, and I say stuff like, ooh, don't hang out with little Jimmy because he's a bad influence, or don't watch that television show because it has language I don't want you repeating. But somehow, as adults, we're immune to that kind of influence. Au contraire, mon frere. I would argue that as adults, we are just as susceptible to those influences. But we have two things that children don't have. You ready for this? We have the ability to justify doing things that are detrimental to us, and then we rationalize the impact of those bad decisions. If you're still questioning me, I'll give you an example by show of hands. And please be honest. Who here has ever gotten into a disagreement with a loved one before work? If your hand's not up, you're a liar. How was the rest of your day? Watch your language. It's not good, right? That one little interaction sets off this chain reaction, right? Sends me down this horrible tangent. All of a sudden, people are cutting me off on the freeway. Somebody parked in my spot in the parking lot. And they're not assigned spots, but they know I park there. Oh, you all have those here too, huh? Some woman's waiting at my desk to show me pictures of her cat post-surgery. I draw from real life experiences. 
And all because I allowed myself to be influenced at the beginning of the day. It sets it off on this tangent. Now, on the flip of that, how many of us have had a rough day at work and had to take that home with us? All of us. We are so easily influenced by things in our lives, and we don't realize it because it happens subconsciously. You would never attach somebody parking in your spot and the anger that's been evoked with that di disagreement that you had in the morning, but they are linked. We're priming our pump every single morning for what we're going to engage in the rest of that day, and we need to be very cognizant of it. I'm not, I'm not saying never look at the news. I'm saying do not start your day from that place because it will set the tone for everything else. Now, anybody that was smugly like, well, I don't look at the news, let me ask this question. Who looks at social media in the morning before work? Be honest. You should stop that, too. <laughs> I'm guilty of it. I'm very guilty of it. I love LinkedIn. I'm addicted to it. It's my platform. But one particular morning, I was walking into my office, and I try to avoid it in the morning. But for some reason, I'm waiting for my computer to boot up, and I opened up Facebook. Now, when people hear about social media, they're like, no, Josh, it's okay. I'm just looking at memes and cat pictures. It's all right. It's safe. No, it still influences us. Because when I opened up Facebook, I had a, a friend that posted something that was absolutely infuriating. I mean, fist-clenching, teeth-grinding anger surged through my body. And you're like, Josh, what did he say? I'm going to share it with you. I want you to be part of this experience. <laughs> For some god awful reason, I opened up Facebook, and there was his status update. And it said, and I quote, I'm so excited. Two hours till wheels up to Tahiti. <laughs> and I did what any of you would do. I took my finger, and spitefully, I hit like. <laughs> no love, like. And it should have ended there. I should be happy for my friend going on his honeymoon. Good for him. But it doesn't stop there, does it? Because the second my computer logs on, I'm on Google. And the first thing I'm Googling, how much are flights to Tahiti? <laughs> What's the best time of year to go to Tahiti? Does anybody know the best time of year to go to Tahiti? It's all year. <laughs> and what shouldn't have impacted my day has now sent me off on this tangent. I'm way off the rails from what I should be doing because it's already almost lunchtime. And I'm still out there, how much are those little cabanas over the water? <laughs> you see, we're constantly being influenced by the things in our life, the things that come in and out of our life. And we need to be very cognizant of that. You need to protect your mental space. If you're going to be the best for your team and for your family and for your communities, we need to be hyper cognizant of how these things are impacting us. But here's the good news, which is pretty wild. Every single one of us wields a tremendous amount of influence in the lives of the people that we come in contact with on a day-to-day -day basis. There are no neutral interactions. There are no neutral interactions. In fact, it doesn't matter if the interaction is via text, email, Zoom, in person, with six feet, masks on. There are no neutral interactions. Every interaction that you have with another human being, you have the opportunity to make their day a little bit better or a little bit worse. To put them more at ease, or to make them more uneasy. It's a tremendous amount of power that you actually wield. A couple of small comments can make somebody's week or it can destroy somebody's day. 